the Joe Rogan experience. And now they're telling, they're watching these, they're these influencers, mm -hmm. which is another thing. Yeah. You know, you have these trans influencers and they promise these girls that if they just go on tea, everything will get better. And the problem... Why do, you, why do you think they do that? Okay. So why do they... A couple reasons. So one is um, testosterone has certain good effects. So it delivers a euphoria and it, it suppresses anxiety. And anxiety is one of their biggest problems. So they go on it and they feel great and they can't wait to tell their friends. It makes their period go away and it redistributes fat. So now these girls feel like I just beat puberty. I feel amazing. I want to tell everybody how great I feel. And they are brave all of a sudden. They're braver and socially bolder. The problem is, of course, what they don't like to talk about online is all the really dangerous stuff that comes with testosterone too. Like it leads to heart uh, infertility, like risk of cardiovascular attack, you know, heart attack, risk of heart attack goes way up. Um, there's, uh, you know, body hair, facial hair. Uh, but don't they want that? So I the think the body hair, facial hair part you, you, for now, but it's permanent. You know, a lot of body this body hair is permanent. It can be. It so can what? Be. But what about when trans women, when a, a, a man transitions to a woman, don't they lose a lot of their body hair? So they lose some of it, but some of them are. I mean, everybody's different, uh -huh. but some of them are stuck with a five o'clock shadow for life. How does a kid know whether they are someone who's being easily influenced and someone who is giving in to this anxiety and you are a part of well, the way you're describing it, a contagion amongst your friends versus someone who's genuinely trans, like someone who genuinely is born in the wrong body? So we have a hundred year diagnostic history of gender dysphoria. We know what it is. It's not guesswork. We know that it is in this whole history. It typically presents in early childhood, ages two to four is when we see it starting. And it was overwhelmingly boys, little boys who say, no, mommy, I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. Call me a girl. Only want to play with other girls. Only want to do, you know, play with girl toys. And they sometimes they hate their sexual organ. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a severe, persistent, insistent, consistent feeling. Um, and, and then a lot of them would grow out of it and some of them wouldn't and they would become what we used to call transsexuals. Um, now we're seeing an explosion of young women, you know, suddenly deciding they're trans with their friends and they are doing it in friend groups. They'll have a whole friend group of trans kids. They are, you know, doing it after social media emergent. Transgender adults never did it because of social media and it certainly never won them friends. Mm. Um, so... What about women that were trans? Like right. you say, predominantly yeah. it's it's boys who wanted to be girls. Right. But what about girls, girls who wanted to be boys? So that existed too, and that also typically began in early childhood. Um, and most most of these kids, if left alone, would outgrow it. So d gender dysphoria is something that you know most most kids. If they even if they experience the real thing, will outgrow, and some won't. Yeah, I was reading uh, an article about gender dysphoria. They were talking about it. First of all, even saying gender dysphoria, I think, is hate speech now. I don't think you're supposed to. It's even, in the DSM. I know. Is the whole DSM hate speech? Yes, everything. <laughs> your hate speech. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? I mean, like everything's hate speech because um, people are gone. They've gone so wacky. But they were talking about um, uh, there was a. a a study done on uh, men who experienced gender dysphoria at a young age and then transitioned to become gay yeah. and just be just became gay just were gay and they realized like this was just a part of their process and they're happy as a gay man and they didn't transition so that's very typical most yeah. of these most of these kids would emerge as homosexual adults that's the thing is just like if we're cool with people being trans and we are obviously we I mean especially adults why you know why is it better that do we like this idea that if you just leave them alone they become gay men or would we I mean are, how many of them would be trans if they were encouraged in that direction how many of are they happier this way or that way like this is a very this is a very human problem yeah and by human problem I mean there's not really a good answer it's there Human problems are slippery problems where it's like you're developing like particularly you're talking about young people They're we're 
hijacking their development. You're you're deciding, okay, have you made a decision? You know what you're going to do forever? All right, we're going to jump in now, and we're going to stop your reproductive cycle. Right. We're going to jump in now and introduce hormones that were never in your body. Yeah. And we're going to, well, a little bit, tiny, tiny mouse. Right. We're going to jack it up to the roof like fucking Hulk Hogan. Right. And you're, you're, you're going to be a different person now. And I, sh- I'm, I hope you can make this decision at 17 that will affect the rest of your life. I hope you're, you're mentally capable of doing that. And that's a tall order. It's a tall order and there's no medical oversight right now. There's right. no matter. I mean, we have no idea what long term testosterone use does to a female's body at 10 to 40 times what her body would normally have. OK, we don't know. We can talk about the risks, but we don't know. But it's not presented to people as a highly experimental medicine, which it is. It's yeah. not reviewed by an institutional review board. Well, they, they make it sound like it's something you can just sign a waiver for and no big deal. Why is that? Why is there no review? Why, why is there no oversight? Why is this? so free and loose i mean is it a sign is it a good sign that we're like more progressive now more open-minded and but because of that things have gotten a little slippery in terms of what we celebrate and what we should rationally step back and objectively analyze and say hey is this really the right way to handle this i i think one of the things that happened was in 2012 wpath which is the transgender health you know uh, organization, um, worldwide organization, um, changed to an informed consent model, saying that people should be able to get the t- the drugs they want or you know claim to need on based on their own recognizance. You sign a form, you're aware of the risks, and then you get it. And the problem was maybe they felt that there was too much gatekeeping, as they call it, or too much questioning. They felt and you know that there were people who weren't getting the medical care they they needed. The problem was. You hit 18, and the age of medical consent varies by state. In Oregon, it's 15. It varies. And you hit that age. You can you can get it. You walk out the door with In it. In Oregon, it's 15? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You're not even a fully formed person. No. And you don't need your parents' approval. Oh, my God. <sighs> we, we were talking before we got on the air um, about uh, children, like really young children transitioning. You were saying that most people who transition know when they're very young. Um, that is a real, uh, that's a hot button topic for people. Children and hormone blockers and children. Yeah. I, what I keep going to is if you are a woman and you, you know you're a woman, wh- why do you need to get these hormones injected into your body? Why why can't you just be a woman? I'll, I'll call you a woman. Like, what are, what are we doing with all these hormones? Like, why are we complete? Like, imagine you're a person who says, I need to transition to be a woman, and I know that I need a chemical that I've never had in my body before. And if I get that chemical injected, then I'm going to be happy. Right. And so if I get surgery, then I'm going to be happy. This is what I'm supposed to be. Right. So the big problem with this is that you're making all the decisions that normally a doctor would make. And you're doing other, it at 15. Right. In yeah. a- any other area of medicine, a doctor makes that. They say, hold on, I know you think you need, you know, whatever, an opioid, but just r- relax. Let's see what you're, you know, th- I mean, that's, you know, effectively what, co- you know, what facilitated the opioid crisis. Doctors just handing over the prescription pad. And we're seeing that right now with anybody who claims to have gender dysphoria. They get it. They, they self-diagnose. They say, no, 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 I know it's my problem. They don't have a mental health professional who says, oh, wait a second, hold on. You have a very high anxiety, depression. You have a lot of other mental health stuff going on. Let's deal with that first. Any therapist who dares to say that might violate one of the 19 conversion therapy laws we now have in 19 different states. There's 19 conversion therapy? I think it's 19, therapy? yeah, which bans conver- so-called conversion therapy, even on gender identity, which means that therapists could lose their license if they say, hold on, I know you want to transition. I know you think your problem is gender dysphoria. Let's talk about some of your other problems. Wow. So a therapist, if you're a 15-year-old kid and you come to a therapist and you say, all my friends are going trans and I, I think I'm trans too, uh, the the doctor has to essentially go with you on this little path you're on? The doctors feel that they have to. I mean, the American, the number of association, American Medical Association, um, Endocrine Society, I mean, you name it, American Pediatric Society, you know, all these med- medical professional organizations, m- most of them have adopted affirmative care, which means their job is to affirm the patient's self-diagnosis with regard to this one issue. I mean, they're, they're you know, it's turning doctors into, I don't know, life coaches, right? 
I mean, they're... How much time have we been doing this for? How long is the time period when this really started to escalate? The last decade. We've seen it fly across the West. I mean, it's in Canada, UK, you know, Scandinavia. We're seeing numbers across the West. All of a sudden, it's teenage girls. It's the very same girls who spread every other, you know, contemporary hysteria or every other hysteria. Um, boy, it makes you feel like there's a lot of lawsuits coming. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, these doc, these girls are getting these things so easily, and they're 15, they're 16, they're 17, they're 18. How many did you interview when you were doing this book? Um, so I, I conducted almost 200 interviews. Um, so how many teenage girls, yeah. or specifically? I actually don't know. I interviewed a lot, a lot of people, and uh, and a bunch of adolescent girls as well. And more I, than 10, more than 20? Yeah, more than 10, but I don't know. Okay. I, I have to, I have a, like spreadsheets for this stuff. Um, yeah. Did you interview ones that were happy with the transition? Yeah, yeah. I did. Um, you know, still very young, but I, you know, um, I interviewed influencers, and I interviewed um, parents, and I interviewed adolescent girls, and some of these girls have, you know, can, stayed with their transition and claimed to be happy. Um, maybe they are, some of them, but the problem is if you ask, if you find out objective things about their lives, right, are you still in school or did you drop out? Or did you cut off your family or did you not? Do you have friends? What's your social life like? What's your job? Do you have a regular job? Very often the picture is, is a dark one. It's not a good one. Isn't that just the case with a lot of people in general, though? I mean, especially people that have the kind of problems that they have to begin with, and they make this gigantic decision. Right. The question is, did did this decision of the transitioning help or hurt? Right. And where would they be if they didn't? You were talking about them before, saying they were already in a dark place. They're already awkward. Right. Teenagers, the kind of girls who cut themselves, kind of girls who are prone to anorexia and yeah. witchcraft. This is you're you're dealing with someone who doesn't have a rosy future already. Right, but I think we used to call that angst, teenage angst. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got past it. The some, problem some is, folks. yeah, well, yeah, you're right. Not everyone, but now they're getting they're getting prescriptions. They're changing the whole course of their lives so easily with no medical oversight. What kind of numbers are we talking about? Like, how how many people are doing this? Okay, so the numbers are harder to track in the United States because we don't have centralized me medical care. Um, and well, here, but here are the numbers that I can tell you. Okay, so gender dysphoria used to afflict 0.01% of the population, so one in 10,000 people. So probably no one you went to high school with. But today, we already know that 2% of high school students are identifying as transgender. And 2% of high school students, you're talking about 1.1 million teenage, you know, high school kids in America. 2%. 2%. And when did this happen? Did and most this of them are girls, yeah. Really? Most yeah. of them are girls? Most of them are girls. Really? Well, I mean, the number, we can just look at the number of gender surgeries. Um, and we see that in 2016, between 2016 and 2017, the number of gender surgeries for biological females quadrupled. So we know they are the biggest and fastest growing population. Wow. Two, that's a stunning number. 2%, you go from... 0.1% of the whole population of the whole population to 2% 2 of high schoolers and the vast majority of them are teenage girls yeah what 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 is the majority like we, we talk about 80% like what is the number I, I don't you know, know. But we have to look at te we, yeah for More every indication girls. I mean we know that you know I can give you a bunch of other statistics one of the reasons it's hard to know exactly how many aside from the fact that we don't have a centralized control of this is because you don't need a, a, an actual diagnosis of gender dysphoria to get testosterone so you just go in and get it. You so don't you, need the diagnosis you know. in England where you, where you have a centralized medical care and there you do need a diagnosis. They know that the numbers are for t for adolescent girls are up over 4,000%. Holy shit. Yeah. So you knew all this stuff before you wrote the book. This was all the numbers that... Was... Well, no, it came out in the course of writing it. Yeah, God. some of so it. So that had to kind of affirm your idea that this was a real problem. I mean, everywhere I looked, it seemed to be a real problem. It wasn't, and nobody wanted to talk about it, but it's real. Well, it's because, like, even when we're talking about it, I'm like, oh, here's a landmine. Oh, here's a landmine. Like, everything we're saying. Like, if you talk at all about trans people, um, you run the risk of pissing people off and offending people and staying out. You know, you're, 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 you're going into an area where it's, unless you are 100% in support 
of their decision and their rights and you, you, you celebrate them, you're going to get in real trouble. Right. But that's why we have this problem. Yeah. Because nobody will talk about it because parents will call me and say, I, I, I've been pro LGBTQ my whole life. I just don't think this is right for my daughter. I can't even talk to my friends about it. I'll get fired from my job if anybody finds this out. Mm. But my daughter's not, she's got a lot of problems, but gender dysphoria is not one of them. Like, I don't think this is right. And I don't think it's going to cure her. And if you have to work and you're at work all day, you know, how much time do you have to even convince your daughter? Your daughter is right. with her wacky friends eight hours a day. And she's on the Internet. And the problem yeah. is her school, her school's already filled out a form calling her Jimmy, right, for oh. a year. They don't even tell you. Whew. <laughs>